more than anybody. I call this job security. <laughs> As a hydrologist for a river forecast center, my shop is responsible for providing forecasts and doing river modeling, both tidal and riverine, mind you, uh, for all of New England and much of New York State. My area covers from approximately Buffalo and the Buffalo Creeks all the way to Canada. Uh, we don't deal with the Susquehanna, so just for the topic of conversation, I call it the Northeast. As a kid born and raised in Rhode Island, you know, I kind of take a appropriate view that way. Uh, we've had a lot of interesting flood events the last 10 or 15 years, and, and jokingly I say job security, but it's impacted millions of people. And the 2010 flood for me was my religious moment, because I grew up on the Patuxent River, I grew up in West Warren. It's ironic that I'm preceded by hurricane talks, because that really was my first love. Uh, but every move I've made in Rhode Island has gotten me farther away from our coastline, because I'm in Cumberland now. <laughs> I don't know if there's a message there. Uh, but that event in 2010 really opened my eyes. And as a modeling center, we would deal with soil moisture all the time. We deal with the movement of water from atmosphere to surface to stream to groundwater. So we have to connect all the dots. And we're seeing things in our models that we're not expecting. We're seeing changes in the behavior of our smaller rivers. Not the big ones yet, but we're seeing changes. And it's changing the way my center has to model rivers like the Patuxent, uh, like the Shawsheen in northeastern Massachusetts, like the Westfield, like the Pemigewasset up in northern New Hampshire. So it's not just a Rhode Island thing. It really is across my whole service area. And those changes to me are a combination of what I call a mixture of ingredients. Now, as we go through this talk, I've put a couple of caveats out there. I'm a meteorologist by degree, I'm a hydrologist by career selection, but I've got the advantage of having lived here my entire life, thankfully. I've been very fortunate to, to say I'm still a Rhode Islander and I hope to die a Rhode Islander. Uh, I love it here, my kids love it here. Uh, it is home. And I hate to see loss of life and damage at home. It hits you. I'm not a climate scientist, so I'm not going to try to fool you into what is or isn't. I'm a practitioner. This is what I do for a living. Be it the hurricane discussion that Dr. Guinness provided to you. Uh, Matt, excellent. Low frequency, high impact events, people don't listen, period. It's hard to get them to move. God, we need your help, the media, to get them to move when we have big events. And we saw the same thing transpire a week ago in Denver, Colorado. They had had big floods in Thompson Canyon before. I drove through about 10 years after the first one. And what did we do to it? Did it again. For me in New England, it's changing the way I do business. But I'm not going to try to tell you what the end state is. I don't know. I'm as anxious to know as you are because my kids are going to be the ones building the homes and buying up the coastal properties in the years to come, right? I'd love to be able to tell them, but I can't. But as a kid who's been born and raised here, it's different. It's not just about the rainfall and the change in temperatures. My pine tree is a dying in Cumberland. Why? I'm losing my white pines. I love the white pines. They're dying. When I grew up as a kid, I used to see praying mantises every summer. When was the last time you saw a praying mantis in this day? The insects are changing. The birds are changing. It's a reflection of this shift we've been undergoing here in the Northeast. But again, maybe this is a plateau we're about to hit. Maybe we'll see things diminish a bit, and then maybe the next ride up the roller coaster is going to be a little more intense. I wish I knew the answer. But what I can tell you is what we've observed. But what I can tell you is that we're not built for this kind of rainfall. We're structurally, our infrastructure is old and aging, and it's not designed for the new reality of how our precipitation has changed. And it's on our smaller rivers where we're seeing the initial impacts of that. And that's what I want to take you through this way. So this whole project started uh, with my desire as a river center to have all this good climato climatology out there for the cities and towns that we provide forecasts for. In Rhode Island, it's the Blackstone at Woonsocket, it's the Patuxent River at Cranston, it's now the Pawcat, as of two weeks from now, it'll be the Pawcat at Western and in Wood River Junction, yay, yay, and the Wood River at Hope Valley soon thereafter. Uh, and so we started looking at this and we've got to figure out what's going on hydrologically with our soil states and the moisture content. If I'm going to make scientifically accurate decisions on how to model these things going forward. So we started by looking at our long-term climate sites, building a climatology of how our rainfall and temperatures have changed in the last 70 years. 
because it's from about 1950 to 2010 that I use as our observational period of temperature, snowfall, precipitation to model the behavior of the water from atmosphere of the soils and to forecast the river. Okay. So that's why that period of time is very important. And, and there's a lot going on. A couple of common themes right up front. We are wetter. I'll prove that to you. No argument. We are wetter. When you look at annual precipitation, without a doubt, we have changed the dynamic. We are warmer, without a doubt. And what's very intriguing to me is how we've done it. Okay, it's not the we're spiraling out of control okay, kind of scenario. It's not. It's a shifting of the middle bound, the middle of the axis, if you will, which we can prove so. But it's significant in how we're doing it. And it plays into how the soils handle the moisture. And it plays into why the situate reservoir, the headwaters of the Patuxent, designed to be full in June, is spilling frantically in March. Okay, it's changes like that in our rivers and streams that we're witnessing and that I model. We've increased the number of these big high impact events, these one, two, three inch dumps of rain in a day. So that's a way that the atmosphere is manifesting this modification, if you will. We've shifted the design storm engineering, how we build our roadways, our culverts, the brick clearances, all of the hard infrastructure were designed off of how it rained in the early 1960s. It's different now. And there's been a dramatic shift, which is why I think there's no accident that we saw the devastating floods in Cranston a month ago, that we saw Fall River go under the gun with a big flash flood last summer. Old cities and towns, aging infrastructure not designed to handle the kind of new war. But again, I'm not saying we're spiraling out of control, but we've shifted the middle of the box, as you'll see. And when it comes to the flood frequency, this is complex because it's a matter of scale. It's a matter of land use, okay, urbanization. What have we done to ourselves in a period of time, 40, 50 years, where nature very gracefully has been turning up the spigot more frequently. So you put two and two together. You take away the green space, you take away the capacity to absorb and retain water, and you put a little more on it, what's going to happen? Soils are wetter, you're going to flood. But it's going to manifest itself in different ways, depending on the locality and the way the basin is designed. So it's not necessarily one-to-one, -one, but it's affecting the way we form things. So is there a common theme of the flood events? Slow-moving weather systems blocked up atmosphere. Who said that? Dr. Guinness said that during his hurricane talk, didn't he? Blocked up atmosphere. Changes to the way the atmosphere moves weather systems around the hemisphere also have an impact on these things we call tropical plumes, these deep conduits of very <coughs> deep moisture in the atmosphere. Our weather systems interact with these plumes quite frequently at our latitude. We happen to be on a place on the planet where our storm systems can tap one of three tropical moisture pools. So I like to look at it as we simply have more opportunity to play with these things. Okay? And that's exactly what's happening. So what's the significance of the moisture pools? Well, for starters, it's 90% of the global meridional water vapor transport. By meridional, we're talking equated to pole. Now to play back into Dr. Guinness's comment about the atmosphere being more blocked, what does that mean? Well, around our hemisphere, weather systems typically move from west to east, at least at our latitude. If we reduce the ice over the pole, you're warming the top part of our globe. You're making a smaller temperature difference. You're changing the temperature gradient between pole and equator. So there's less of a temperature change in a global scale. The atmosphere responds to changes in temperature high in the atmosphere by the jet stream. So the climate theory states that by shrinking that ice sheet, little by little, like we've done, over the long term, not these cycles of all of a sudden we have a lot of ice extent, small ice extent, but this trend to have a smaller ice cap changes the flow of the jet stream around the hemisphere, such that we have less and less occurrence of strong westerly wind flow. The atmosphere has to make up for that by increasing this transport south to north. That's the meridional flow. Okay. What does that do? Well, it does two things. 
it transports these plumes northward with a greater degree of frequency. And because the atmosphere is blocked, in other words, big high here, big low here, it's stuck in a rut, we get 2010 events. Five big rain events in four weeks. You get hit succession after succession after successive time. So you kind of get stuck in a rut. What happened in Colorado last week? Three events in five days. Connected to two tropical moisture plumes, the Gulf and the Pacific plume. Okay. Same thing that happened over New England in 2010. Ours was Gulf Coast and Atlantic plume. Okay. But the plumes themselves have changed. We're measuring contents of water in these plumes we've never seen before. Okay? We're increasing the capacity of these plumes to hold water and moving that water in the water vapor state to our latitude with greater frequency. Why is it holding more moisture? We believe, hypothetically, it's related to a warming climate, warming ocean and warming atmosphere. So these are the dots we're trying to connect. But it's not a straight line. You put a hemispheric event like a big El Nino on top of this cycle, little bolt bets are off because that is a big atmospheric chess player, <laughs> oceanic and atmospheric, that can nudge the line one way or the other. Okay? You have a big volcanic eruption deep in the tropics. That's going to change the whole dynamic for a year or two or three. So you might actually neuter the signal. But you're going to keep, keep going back and get on that same slope. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is it did a lot of complex things of work here, but there is a general sense of how the atmosphere, ocean, and the water content in the atmosphere are playing. And at our latitude, where we are, two storm tracks coming out of Canada, coming up the East Coast, both of these storm tracks can interact with three tropical plumes, and I argue it's doing it more frequently. When we get in these ruts, we're in it for a few days. Let's go back as early as June. What did we start the flooding hit parade with in New England? Andrea, tropical cyclone. Five inches of rain and we flooded the Pawcatuck and we flooded the Patuxent. Surprise, surprise. And what did we do to New York State a week later? Same environment, we nudged the plume about 100 miles west and we obliterated the town of Oneida, New York. Big flash flood. So this is the way the atmosphere tends to play out. And I have the octopus task of trying to figure it all out for you today. So, the climate hypothesis. These streams of moisture you see, there's one really good one. If you look, they're coming across Mexico up into the southeast. This was the beginning of the sequence of events in 2010 that laid waste to parts of Rhode Island. Just to give you an idea of how global in scale these moisture feeds are, that's a big one that goes all the way into the roots of the Pacific, cutting across Mexico, grabbing Gulf moisture, and so on. So hemispherically, it's all related to how the jet streams are being modified. We're warming on a large scale, ocean and atmosphere, gradually, gently. It gives the atmosphere the capacity to hold a little more water vapor. So the moisture plumes have got a little more beef. And at our latitude, with our type of storm cracks, we play in that sandbox a little too frequently for my liking. All right. Questions on the kind of science connection here. Because it's a lot I'm throwing at you. But in essence, it's a little warmer. It's causing more water in these plumes vapor for the storms to act on. And with the modifications of the ice sheet, we're changing the jet stream configuration so that we tend to get in these ruts more often. And now we're going to look at how that's been manifesting itself over the last so many years. What I have here, and for the cheap seats, my apologies, I realize the font's hard to see. You just have to trust me. Uh, from left to right, we have uh, the observed annual, that's the yearly temperature, high, low every day, divide by two, and then add them up over 365 or six if it's a leap year, and then you got yourself an average annual temperature. It's, each of these graphics stems from 1930 to 2012, this is annual air temperature. So our annual temperature at Providence in the upper left, Portland, Maine in the upper right, Hartford, Connecticut in the lower left, Burlington, Vermont in the lower right. So I'm trying to give you the New England perspective. What I want to point out to you is temperature. And what is, to me, the more dramatic feature is where the yellow circles are. We aren't cold anymore. 
we don't see below zero low temperatures anymore, or rarely here in the other coast. We are warming by actually losing the cold years, and that's very dramatic. An annual temperature of, say, 48 or 49 degrees simply doesn't exist anymore. Now, over the span of this period of time, we averaged about an increase of air temperature, annual temperature, about one degree Fahrenheit every 50 years, plus or minus. A couple of places, a little more. Burlington, it's been only 33 years. Hartford, as much as 88. They're a valley location close to a river. So there's some, some argument there of sheltering and so on, which is why they may not be as, as warm at night as the metropolitan. But that's a huge shift. You increase your annual average temperature two years in a century, and you're talking you've got a climate like New Jersey. It's a shift. Okay? So, but look at also, I think it's no accident oops, that in the red circles we're seeing a clustering of these warmest years all in the last 20 years. This is the actual data from each one of these long term reporting stations. It's dramatic to me, very dramatic to me that you have such a strong signature of losing the real cold years that my grandparents used to experience, right? Grandpa walking uphill both ways in the snowstorm, okay? They don't exist anymore. It's fascinating to me. But we are warm. We are seeing an increase in these 90 degree or warmer days. It's happening. And we're seeing a reduction in the number of days below zero. That changes things. Changes the dynamic, vegetation, birds, insects, and all that. And fun. Precipitation. What you have here from 1930 to 2012 is the annual precipitation at each one of these sites Providence, Portland, Hartford, Burlington. Look at the strong signatures, the clustering of the wet years since 1970, and a dramatic <coughs> reduction in the dry years. That changes things. That changes the way I model rivers. It changes how our rivers and streams respond because these are strong signals. At TF Green Airport, we are averaging an increase in annual rainfall of an inch every eight and a half years. That's a lot of water. And it's how it rains itself out. That is it's why we are seeing this increased flooding in these small watersheds that simply have lost the capacity to hold. Another way of looking at this is by looking at the good old 100-year rainfall event, right? Everybody knows it doesn't mean you can only get it once in 100 years, okay? It's the one, it's the value of rainfall measured over 24 hours that has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year, okay? But why is that number important? Because that's what we design on. And we've been designing off the 1961 study for 50 years. Well, today, that design storm ranges from eight and a half to nine inches. So in other words, that 1% event for one day of rainfall is about eight and a half to nine inches. You know what it was back in the 60s? Seven. That's a two inch shift in the design storm. That has huge ramifications to how we build the infrastructure, to the spillway capacities at our reservoirs and at our dams. It's big, it's significant. Another way of looking at that very simply is a percent change. And look at the car, it's coastal New England. Would that be a surprise? What did the majority of our storms track? Right through coastal New England. Another way of looking at it is using the Palmer Drought Index. This is an index that <coughs> tries to cascade rainfall and accumulated rainfall over six to nine months in its effect on soil moisture. Anything in yellow indicates drought. And the lower the value, the more intense the drought. The green represents a wet state, and the higher the value, the more saturated you are. Look at the change over Rhode Island. As we've moved from 1930 to 2012, those occurrences of dry episodes have not only shrunk in intensity, but they've narrowed or reduced in their duration. Meanwhile, the wet periods are becoming more intense in more duration, longer duration. And that's why our rivers and streams are doing what they're doing. All right. So to wrap this up, we're going to talk about the flood frequency. In essence, what we're seeing is an increase in flooding, either intensity of flooding or frequency of flooding, primarily at our small watersheds. We'll stop with Rhode Island and in Rhode Island. This is the gauge at Woonsocket, looking at the rivers and stream flow from 1929 to 2012. 
What you see here is that prior to 1970, where this inflection point is from a climate standpoint, what we have seen is a dramatic increase in the number of floods in any given 30 year period. So each bar represents a flood. Its color represents its magnitude, red being moderate, magenta being major. The big flood for them was back in 55, but notice we only had a handful of floods prior to 1970. Flood control was put in up in Woonsocket and up in Worcester, the Worcester Diversions, to help retain some flow. Corps of Engineers put in West Hill Dam. Now, what I don't mean to say here is that they put the dam in and it caused more flood. No, no, no. But what we have seen here is an increase in these minor floods. What would have happened if we didn't have flood control? My guess is their intensity would be greater. Yet, we're still seeing an increase in the number of magenta or red floods. So, here we have a small watershed with some flood control. That is definitely seeing a change in the number of floods, the increase in the frequency of flooding, not necessarily the magnitude. Let's go up to the Merrimack Valley, the Shawshine River. Now here the period of record is only back to 1964. But if you compare, say, 1980 back to 1984, notice we've got a big increase, not in the number of floods, but in their intensity. More reds and magentas. That means more moderate and major floods but not necessarily more of them in a given year or more over that period. So you see how, it's, how these things play out differently depending on the scale of the base. Let's go up north to the Pemigewasset River up in Plymouth, uh, New Hampshire. Now this record goes all the way back to the beginning of the century. You know, and they had their big magenta floods, their big, big floods, 36, 38, everybody knows about those. But look at what's happened since 1970. Not only are we seeing more floods, we're getting multiple floods in a year. They're getting whacked two, three times with a lot more frequency, and they're more intense floods. But Hartford, the Connecticut River, where there's a ton of flood control, Army Corps of Engineers facilities that are there to hold and retain water until the flood goes by and then they let the water out. Okay. This is what you'd expect. We haven't seen much of a shift in either intensity or frequency, but I think, again, it's a matter of scale. That's a huge base with a lot of flood control. So we've shifted the dial, but not to the degree of these big watersheds you see. My poster child is the Tuxet River in France. Look at the lack of flooding from 1968 back to the beginning of when they measured the river. Okay? Very few events. What did we do in the late 60s? We put in two shopping malls and two interstates. And that changes the ability of the basin to retain water, does it not? Because you're chucking down impervious surface by the bucket load at a time when the atmosphere started raining more. And look at what has happened since 1990. Look at the increase in not only frequency, you got a busy job today. <laughs> Increased frequency and intensity of flooding on that kind of watershed. So that's what I'm getting at. So to wrap it up, New England is a hot spot. One of two that other federal agencies are identifying. The U.S. Geological Survey who owns and operates all of these stream gauges. They're seeing it too. The Red River of the North and New England and New York seem to be two hot spots where we're seeing this kind of trending of precipitation and temperature in a, in a very dramatic response in stream flow and flood frequency. I, I'd like to think there's got to be a dry side to this, but I'm not convinced anymore. What we're seeing is if we get a dry period, it's intense, but it's very short duration. Thankfully, a lot of our water supply reservoirs are built for the two year drought that we had in the 60s. I'm not so concerned about running out of water anymore. I'm worried about more and more people with greater frequency having to deal with the flooding we've seen in the last 10 years. So, thank you.